Good evening, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us for a very exciting webinar tonight. We're talking triathlon training and triathlon nutrition. We've got a couple great guests lined up for you to share their insights. Uh, my name is Varun Sriram with Generation UCAN. Thanks to everybody that's joining us, giving up some of their Wednesday night. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests. Uh, first of all, are joined by Ironman Maryland winner, Matt Bach. Uh, Matt uh, won uh, Ironman Maryland in 2014, blazing fast time of 8.51.24. Matt is joining us from his home in New Jersey. Matt, how are you doing tonight? Great. Well, awesome, Matt. It's, uh, it's fantastic to have you on here. We will get back to you in just a moment. Uh, kind of want you to let the folks know how you got involved in the sport and your background as well. Uh, we also have uh, joining us, uh, Harvey Geyer, um, triathlon coach. Uh, as you can see by the picture, um, Harvey's had quite an amazing uh, weight loss journey himself in the sport of triathlon. He's a phenomenal athlete now. Harvey, thanks so much for joining us. That is a pretty ugly picture you have of me. <laughs> Used with your permission, I promise you, Harvey. I, was, <laughs> I, I would not put you out there like that. But uh, Harvey, we'll get back to you. Uh, Harvey's joining us from his home in uh, Georgia. Uh, Harvey, we'll get back to you here in just a moment to uh, give you a chance to introduce yourself to the uh, live audience in attendance. Um, but Matt, let's start with you. Uh, really a breakthrough performance at Ironman Maryland last year. Uh, what's your background in the sport of triathlon? How did you get involved uh, in competing? Sure. Um, well, back in, uh, you know, my athletic career sort of started when I was in middle school, high school. I did some running just because my friends ran and they just, you know, goaded me into it. And I hated it at first, uh, but started doing that during high school and, uh, you know, got better. Um, and then was like, hey, what if I actually try? And so I got, you know, better and better. And uh, so running's my background. I ran a little bit in college. Uh, and then, you um, I stopped for a little while, took sort of took a break from athletics, but then just you know had the bug and got back into it. Um, back in 2000, uh, 2008, I did the Baltimore Marathon, um, and and I realized all through high school and then through the marathon there that the longer the better for me. I, I seem to do better relative to the competition. Uh, you know, the longer the better. So marathons or a full Ironman, um, you know, which I ultimately turned uh, turned out doing. Um, so I did. Uh, I did uh, New York in 2000, uh, I think it was 2011 or 2012, um, did my first Ironman, my first triathlon in 2010, uh, and then my first Ironman in 2012, uh, and then since then I've done uh, now five uh, Ironman events and you know, several half Ironman events and other uh, you know, Olympic events and sprint events um, as well. So yeah, it's been, uh, you know, I did my first triathlon, I did fairly well at it relative to the people in the, in the group. So or in the race and then from there I just you know caught the bug and just really got a, kind of addicted to it and loved it. And Matt uh, you know what should be noted is that you right now aren't a pro so you're what a lot of folks uh, you're doing what a lot of folks who are tuning in um, are, are doing themselves you know balancing a full-time job uh, with uh, training for triathlon. Just uh, speak to that for a moment how do you manage to uh, fit it all in? <laughs> yeah well uh, yeah I live in Summit New Jersey uh, I work in Manhattan uh, so I commute about an hour, 15 minutes each way uh, to work. I work at a hedge fund in Manhattan uh, called Ophir Partners. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Uh, my wife is forgiving and very, um, very supportive. <laughs> um, but uh, I just uh, I do a lot of my training in the morning. So that way when things get crazy in the evening um, or, you know, for whatever reason, I'm not able to do, you know, get a workout in, then, you know, it's done in the morning, so I, I like to make sure I get it done in the morning, uh, and then sometimes I have to do doubles anyway, uh, so I have to do one in the evening too. But um, yeah, just uh, you know, wake up early and just got to make sure you get enough sleep. And you know, working out at all times of the day certainly re uh, requires you to be conscious and uh, and very mindful of your nutrition and, and fueling those workouts at different times of the day. Certainly something that we'll, we'll cover at length um, as we uh, dive deeper into the the main topic of this webinar. Um, Thanks for that intro, Matt. Um, Harvey, uh, let's uh, let's get to you. So you're a, a triathlon coach, and I know that uh, a lot of folks that are going to be attending the uh, the triathlon camp that you're part of at uh, in Chattanooga, the um, Ironman Chattanooga camp this weekend, and then the Ironman Augusta camp that you're also uh, putting on uh, later in August. Uh, I know we have a lot of people from those two camps that have joined us on this webinar, so a big shout out to all you guys. Uh, much appreciated for you all taking your time uh, this evening to join us, but Harvey, let's uh, let's go to you. How did you get um, started in the sport of triathlon? And, and I guess 
how did you go from the guy on the right to the uh, the guy on the left, who's a pretty darn impressive athlete? Oh yeah, yeah. Just looking at that picture brings back some good memories of the coconuts and drinking all that and enjoying life. Um, but now it's not like that anymore. We don't get to drink coconuts and lay around and read books because when you're training for half Ironman and long, uh, you know, longer course like full Ironman, you're having to train all the time and, you know, make use of your time to the, you know, to every little last morsel of it. Um, yeah, it just started with walking. It started with jogging, a 5K, like a lot of people. I happen to be, uh, you know, just, I was obese. I was about 300 pounds and uh, I just needed something so that I could, you know, hopefully live long and be around for my kids sake and so I just worked my way up the distances um, you know eventually uh, in 2008 I think I qualified for Boston and then uh, 2009 I did my first Ironman and I just kind of been at it ever since really and uh, uh, yeah like um, I, didn't, I wasn't really naturally talented or that I, that I was aware of I never had any background in this sort of thing but uh, found out I was pretty decent I still stink on the swim. Matt, he crushed me. I don't know if you'll check times, but he probably beat me by about two hours or so in uh, Maryland last year. But, you know, every once in a while I can pull off a really good race. And, uh, um, but, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a good learning process. And I think, you know, like now we're starting to nail these nutrition plans, and that's really been helpful, you know, where you don't have to worry about GI issues or, um, you know, these sorts of things, you know, the, the, the plan that I'm using seems to be working for me. It's keeping me lean. Um, and it's also helping me to be fast. So really, uh, Harvey, that's a great segue to, to dive into kind of our main, uh, topic of conversation today. And, uh, that's really fueling, uh, for triathlon training. And, um, you know, we're going to talk a lot about um, a nutrition concept that's gaining more and more steam called metabolic efficiency, which I know you and Matt are both very familiar with. And uh, we're absolutely going to talk about how uh, you can um, fits in uh, from a, a sports nutrition standpoint and, and really what makes it unique in terms of the way it delivers energy. But before we really dive in um, too deeply to the you can aspect of things, I think it's important to understand, um, you know, kind of the way that energy is delivered to the body um, and what this idea of metabolic efficiency is all about. So, Matt, um, we'll go back to you. When you were first, um, you know, transitioning uh, to longer course triathlon and, and the nutrition element of it really became something that you had to focus on, um, I guess starting out, you know, what were you doing? Uh, what did you think you needed to do to fuel your body uh, for long course triathlon and, um, you know, what, what were you kind of taught as you entered the sport? Yeah. Um, well, it's this conventional wisdom out there that you know, just about everybody is taught and it's that, you know, eat lots of carbs because you have to replace the carbs that you burn and eat pasta and bread and, you know, all this, all this stuff that you, I heard it from all angles, uh, all my training partners, everyone was telling me all these like nutritionists and things and were telling me that that's what you're supposed to do, uh, if you're training for Ironman. And, it, you know, that's just what I did then because that's what everybody was telling me to do. So for my first four Ironman events, I tried to train my gut to absorb lots of calories. And I tried every sports mix drink out there. I tried goo, you know, EFS. I tried Perform. I tried Carbo Pro, like all these different, you know, Heed, all these different things. And they all seemed sort of the same to me. They were just very sugary. They all gave me stomach aches if I drank enough of it which, you know, generally during a race, you're drinking quite a bit of it, and I had issues. Um, so if the first four Ironman events that I did, two of them, I had issues enough where it majorly affected my race. It slowed me down quite a bit when I got to the run. And Matt, uh, uh, I if just, I could just uh, yeah. interrupt you there for just a moment, when you talk about having issues, are we talking about uh, stomach issues or energy issues? What, what types of issues are you talking about? Yeah, both. Uh, in one of them, I, I came near bonking, uh, and then, you know, and then one of the other at Ironman Lake Placid in 2012, uh, and then in 2013 I um, I took too much, uh, and so the sugar affected my stomach. I had stomach aches, bloating. I was in the porta potty a good dozen times over the course of 10 miles, uh, just a, a disaster uh, in 2013 at Ironman Lake, Lake Placid. Uh, Lake Placid again. 
so that was kind of uh, the the traditional notion. Uh, you know, we, we hear uh, 250 to 400 calories per hour for for males. You know, maybe in the uh, 200 to 300 range for a lot of females. Um, that's kind of what people are looking at. Uh, that 30 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour in that range. Is that um, what you were doing in, in terms of caloric intake uh, to fuel your training? Yeah, yeah. I was taught this formula, you know, twice your body weight in calories per hour. So I was like, okay, I'm 145 pounds, so I should be taking 290 calories per hour. And so I tried doing that during Ironman events, and I couldn't even get that much into my system because it was all just so sugary and I had stomach aches and I didn't want to drink it anymore. Uh, but even just doing as much as I did, which was about 2,000 to 2,500 calories for my first four Ironman events, even just having that, I, my stomach was just, you know, it was it was awful, uh, and it dramatically affected my race, and I was walking parts of the marathon, um, and, you know, then compare that to Ironman Maryland, uh, I had 830 calories, 94 calories an hour, I came nowhere near balking during the race, and I also uh, had no GI issues. That's uh, that's I'm sure what you just said is going to trigger a lot of, uh, you know, surprise from people when they hear this. And uh, and, you know, guys, we swear to you, it's not it's it's not magic. Um, it, it is very much possible. And, and Matt, hold that thought for just a minute. We're going to uh, talk uh, for sure a lot more about how exactly you train your body um, to do so. Now, Harvey, I want to um, uh, kick it over to you and kind of ask you the similar question when you got, uh, you know, in the sport uh, involved in the sport of triathlon. You know, I know that. Um, to go from the guy on the right to the guy on the left, uh, you had a lot of success um, using the Atkins diet and, you know, lowering, lowering your carbohydrate intake and lowering your sugar intake in order to achieve, um, you know, significant weight loss. But then you got involved in the sport of triathlon and kind of, um, you know, what were you taught in terms of what you needed um, for fuel? Yeah, I mean, Matt's lucky because I weighed over 200 pounds and I was in the Clydesdale division. So when he did his formula, I used the same formula, and I had to do 400 and 450 calories per hour. And, uh, yeah, it was just ridiculous, man. And, and like I said, I'd probably gain two to five pounds a week training for for half Ironman or an Ironman. It's, it was just stupid. I was just taking in so many calories and uh, just couldn't possibly process those. So they were just laying on my gut. And, uh, yeah, after having lost, you know, in the vicinity of 100 pounds, um, trying to get myself down and then to be gaining, constantly gaining about two pounds a week during the peak training, um, that was just really disheartening. Uh, you, you know, and, and you also you had your hit and misses, like, which I didn't realize was, you know, I would think it was training based. I'd go out for a long ride. And I'd be out, and at mile 35, I'd be like, you know, like, I'm really fit. Why am I feeling like rubbish today? And it was probably because I hadn't redosed sugar as quick as I needed to. So um, it was, you know, it was just a process of getting disheartened, gaining weight, and with the negative effects of sugar, um, especially when my whole lifestyle was geared around low carbs. Uh, you know, managing the, the carbohydrate, but um, uh, in particular, the, one of the things that stuck out for me in Atkins was he says sugar has no nutritional value. So here I am shoving this sugar in because I need it for the, you know, for the race, but at the same time, I'm gaining weight and just feeling miserable and putting myself at risk. So um, it, I needed something different, and that's kind of when I, I just fortunately lucked into uh, you can and Bob Sebahar and that whole approach and that really you know it just caused me to turn a corner I dropped 30 pounds real quick and like I said I had that breakthrough race where I broke 430 at the half iron distance and for a guy my size that's just uh, that's just uh, you know not likely to be seen Harvey, uh, what's another perspective that you have as, as somebody that coaches uh, athletes, um, you, you know, is uh, and, and I don't want to get it twisted like we're, we're talking about you, uh, you know, in the context of, of weight loss. Uh, but uh, like like I said off the top, I mean, you're a, you're a heck of an athlete um, in your own right. But but what's fascinating about, you know, kind of the different points that you and Matt raised about the traditional uh, approach to fueling is that that uh, weight gain aspect that you experienced when you were fueling, um, you know, with the sugars and relying on them as your primary fuel and training. Uh, 
with the athletes you coach and you know with the age groupers that that you're around what percentage of them would you just say uh, have some type of body composition goal when they're training for a race i mean from my standpoint the vast majority of triathletes are fighting the battle of the bold um you know so there are i do work with some and there's some on my team that are you know they their their problem is the opposite where they're trying to you know retain the weight or gain weight because they're just not able to keep it on but i would say uh, by and large, the vast majority of triathletes are fighting the battle of the bulge in some way or another. And, uh, you know, this is a huge problem. I get approached, you know, three to six, three to five times a week from people that just, you know, know the story or know my connection to UCAN or my weight loss. Um, not all of them end up being coached athletes. A lot of them I just kind of, you know, give them some feedback about, you know, some of the quick little changes that they can make to their diet or to their fueling during the training and racing and how to do it. Um, you know, like some, a little bit off topic, but you know, some of them come to you and they just read the box and they say, or the, the packet or they read the bucket that they get from you can. And they say, oh, I got to do this. And the first time they try it, it doesn't work. Well, now they want to quit that whole approach. And you know, they they don't recognize that your miles, your mileage may vary, and that you may have to adjust the dosage of you can to your to your own needs. <clears throat> Excuse me, Barn. Got something in my throat. No, no problem. No problem. <clears throat> um, but to speak to that point, Harvey, and we'll get into that more. You know, there is certainly a timing and a and a strategic element to the to the dosing and and uh, implementation of you can, but. Before we go that far, you know, I want to um, kind of uh, walk through the way different types of carbohydrates, um, you know, will impact your energy levels and um, your ability to, to utilize your, your fat for fuel and, and kind of talk about this concept that's gaining more and more steam uh, called metabolic efficiency. And Matt, uh, you'll certainly be able to, to lend some of your experiences here. But uh, if we look at the, the graph that we see uh, on the screen, you know, with your, your typical carbohydrates, your, your typical sugar-based uh, sports nutrition, your gels, your blocks, um, uh, they're all, uh, you know, either contain simple sugars, sucrose or fructose, or, um, you know, uh, slightly more complex carbohydrate called maltodextrin, um, which essentially breaks down and, and, and is uh, a simple sugar. Um, and, and really the impact that these simple carbohydrates have is they cause a spike in your blood sugar. So, it's the classic case of what goes up must come down, right? When you have that big spike, usually about 25 to 40 minutes later, it's going to be caused by a significant drop in, in blood sugar. And, and that drop is, is what we perceive as the sugar crash. So a lot of times when people say they feel like they bonked, um, it's not actually that they're, they uh, have depleted their stored carbohydrates. You know, people get so caught up in this idea of I need to replace what I burn, but, but so many times that, that feeling of, energy fluctuations or bonking or, or brain fog during exercise is caused by drops in blood sugar. Um, and, and things that spike blood sugar aren't just limited to sugar-based sports nutrition, right? If, if, if we kind of even look at kind of the, the typical, uh, you know, endurance athlete foods that people might have before a workout, things like bananas, uh, bagels, you know, cereals, even these are very fast acting. They're designed to give you that, that flash, uh, that, that quick surge of carbohydrate, but they're not really designed to maintain your energy. So you're forced to fuel, you know, with calories and carbohydrates uh, much more frequently when you're constantly putting your body through these ups and downs in blood sugar. Now, the other thing that's going on here is anytime you get that sugar spike, the body produces this hormone called insulin. Now, insulin is, um, you know, it's, it's very important. It helps get that excess sugar out of your bloodstream, but it's also one of the most sensitive hormones in the body. And insulin is a fat storage hormone. When you spike your sugar and you spike your insulin, you're, you're basically telling the body to store fat rather than burn it to its full potential. Now, exercise is really a stimulus to get your body to burn fat. You know, that's, that's what your body wants to do during exercise. And when you're constantly dosing and fueling with these fast-acting sugars and fast-acting carbs, in, in a way, you're, you're putting something in your system that's working counter to what exercise is trying to get your body to do, which is burn fat. Uh, so that's what, what Harvey's talking about, you know, why a lot of folks uh, training for, in, for marathons or, or long course triathlon actually gain weight is because they're really training their body in such a manner by virtue of their nutrition to rely on sugars and 
carbohydrates rather than to tap into and, and to burn fat. Um, so metabolic efficiency, which uh, Matt, uh, I'd love to, to hear how you kind of got um, tuned into this concept. Metabolic efficiency is really a nutrition concept that, that um, you know, has been um, – gotten a lot of prominence um thanks to a gentleman by the name of Bob Sibahar who Harvey referenced that uh, Bob was the uh uh team dietitian for the 2008 US Olympic triathlon team in Beijing um he was also one of the guys that was actually responsible for UCAN launching into sports nutrition which we will get into the backstory of UCAN here in in a few minutes but um you know Bob has really championed this concept of metabolic efficiency and teaching and training the body to utilize more fat for fuel. Uh, Matt, how did you um, get interested in metabolic efficiency? How did you hear that there was, you know, another way than the traditional approach to fueling? Yeah, uh, a friend of mine and training partner, uh, her name is Nikki Schock. Uh, she started uh, a business of her own. Uh, she was mentored by Bob Sibahar on metabolic efficiency training, and her business was, uh, or is, is uh, called Elevate by Nikki, and it's to... Um, teach athletes like me and you know like many of the people on the on this webinar um, to teach their body to burn fat through metabolic efficiency training uh, because you know I think one of the important points here is that your body even if you do things like carbo load and everything your body can only store as much as around 2,000 calories worth of carbohydrates and your body has even as a very lean athlete I you know everyone everyone on this webinar has tens of thousands of calories of fat so if you're doing something like an Ironman that requires something like seven to 10,000 calories or more, the 2,000 calories of carbohydrates doesn't take you there. So you need to eat to make up that deficit. But the problem or, or the, the solution here is, you know, tap into that fat, those fat stores and teach your body to burn that fat more efficiently at your race paces so that you can tap into that, you know, nearly unlimited supply of fuel. Um, so I spoke with uh, with Nikki last year when she when she was sort of starting her business and um, and she was telling me these crazy things like you know people can do Ironman and burn uh, and and uh, take in less than 100 calories per hour and you know these things that just made no sense to me uh, it went totally against everything that this conventional wisdom and all my training partners had been telling me. Uh, and so I was intrigued. I was like, you're, you're crazy. I want to find, you know, the hole in this. I want to punch holes in it. <laughs> and so I kept drilling her with questions for like, you know, weeks. And uh, I think she probably got a little, a little annoyed with me because I was just asking so many questions. But eventually I, I said, okay, I'm just going to give it a shot. Like I couldn't find, I was like digging around on the internet and I just couldn't find anything negative that anybody had to say about it. Uh, so I was like, okay, I'm just going to give it a shot. I'll work with Nikki. Um, work with this metabolic efficiency training, just commit to it, and let's just see how it goes. I got nothing to lose. Um, and I did uh, a metabolic efficiency test uh, with Nikki, which measures um, which measures how fast your body is burning fat relative to carbs uh, at various paces. And I did a test before I started working with her, and then five weeks working with her on my diet, and then you know five weeks later I did another test. And the the changes were dramatic. Like I, I was burning at race pace on the treadmill running. Uh, at race pace, I was burning 60% carbs and 40% fat at the beginning. And then the after five after just five weeks of changes in my diet, I was burning the flip of that, the 40% carbs and 60% fat at race pace. So it meant that I had to rely much less on food. Uh, for fuel, and I could rely much more on my body, on the fat stores in my body uh, at race pace, and that was just like mind-boggling to me. And then I applied that in practice at Ironman Maryland uh, two weeks after that uh, by taking so few calories. I mean, only only 94 calories an hour. Amazing, Matt. The tons of tons of good stuff that you just said there. I want to just uh, re-emphasize a couple things that you mentioned that I think are significant. So. For any of you guys that have met Matt or, or seen pictures or know Matt, uh, you know he's he's a very lean guy. I think he, he mentioned uh, you know 145 pounds uh, previously was kind of um, where his weight is uh, where his weight is around. Then you know the, the question that so many people who are uh, you know as lean as Matt or, or somewhere in in that range always wonder is um, you know do I have enough body fat to burn for fuel? And what Matt said is right on. You know even the leanest people have tens of thousands of, of calories stored as fat. So there, there is nobody here that doesn't have 
enough stored body fat that they can utilize as fuel. And and again, the key point that Matt mentioned is it doesn't matter how much you carbo load, your body can only store a finite amount of carbohydrates. So, uh, you know, I, I always compare this to cramming for the test, right? It's uh, you're, you're not going to learn it all the night before. And, and it's the same thing with carb loading. You know, you're not going to be able to store infinite amounts of carbohydrate just by eating a ton of pasta or, or something, you know, the, the night before a race. And one of the things that stuck out to me the first time I, I spoke with Bob Sebahar, you know, this is probably back in 2010 or 2011. Um, he said to me that, you know, the average person has enough stored carbohydrate to fuel two to three hours of moderate exercise. That same person has enough stored fat to fuel eight to 10 Ironman distance triathlons. And, you know, so just from an available fuel point. So when you, you think about it in that manner, you know, fat is such an abundant source of energy. Um, so it really makes sense, you know, both from a performance and a body composition standpoint that we want to teach our body to better utilize fat. And, and remember, uh, you, you'll see this as we get more into this, but even from the implementation of UCAN, you know, we, we're not at all, uh, metabolic efficiency is not a low carb diet, you know, it's in, so I want to be clear on that. You know, there, there's, you're still implementing carbs, Matt will speak to this, um, you know, a, as well, but you're not totally eliminating carbs. It's just a matter of the timing of carbohydrate and the right types of carbohydrates, you know, rather than the fast acting and the sugar based carbs, you want, you want to, uh, you know, either pair carbohydrates with other nutrients that'll support the stabilization of blood sugar, or you want to, to utilize carbs that stabilize blood sugar. And, and we'll get back to this point time and time again, but it's really the stabilization of blood sugar, uh, which can in layman's terms be translated to, you know, stable blood sugar is the same as steady energy. When you don't have swings in blood sugar, you simply don't have swings in your energy and you don't feel as fatigued. Um, so that's really what we're getting at here. The larger point is metabolic efficiency is uh, a way to stabilize your energy without having to take in so many calories. Uh, Harvey, how about you? When, when you um, were tipped off uh, by Bob Sebahar to this whole idea of metabolic efficiency, uh, I mean, what did you think? Uh, did you think it was possible? What, how, how did you get uh, clued into this as a, as a method of nutrition? Yeah, so, like, my background, as I told you, for losing all that weight, you know, let's say about a decade prior was just a low-carb lifestyle, and, I, you know, I, I was trying to do that with everything, um, and, of course, then the longer you, your races and your training becomes, the more you get directed, most of us conventionally get directed towards the sugar, you know, uh, method, and uh, so... Uh, which went counter to what my lifestyle was. Um, but what Bob talked about was that we periodize our nutrition and we, me we meet our training and our racing needs by manipulating uh, the introduction of good carbs predominantly um, as the training picks up, as the racing picks up. So you can still be low carb, but that would probably be more so in the off season when you're training heavily and, you know, just base training. And as you get closer towards the races, you start needing more whole grains, needing more complex carbohydrate. Um, and you can't just rely on your, you know, your healthy fats, your lean proteins, your veggies. You need some more stuff in there to, uh, you know, more sugar, healthy carbohydrate to, to use for energy uh, as you go along. Um, so um, I think, you know, what I learned was from Bob was that it wasn't about just being low carb. It was m matching your, your food to the training and the racing that you were doing. And that was huge. That was a huge concept for me. Um, and like I said, when I pulled the sugar away from the winter training, um, I quickly dropped like 30 pounds and had that breakthrough race. So it was amazing how your body really uh, responds when you're training heavily. Normal, you know, we, when I say heavily, uh, most people don't train like we do even in the base season. Um, so when I was doing base training, which most people would consider heavy cardio, vascular workouts, um, I was just dropping weight real quick. And, uh, um, and as it picked up, I started adding more back in, but you know, it's nice to just cut weight real quick, look lean and, uh, not feel like you have to be pounding that 
you know, sugar all year long. So Matt, um, as you were mentioning uh, that you started working with uh, Nikki Schock, um, your, your nutritionist, and she started implementing metabolic efficiency, um, what were some changes you know, that you made in terms of your daily nutrition? How did Nikki um, suggest to you to think about pairing foods together uh, in order to get this steady blood sugar effect? Yeah, so the general idea is, is you want to take in a lot more protein with the carbs. Um, so you know, generally the ratio that I'm eating in is uh, 2 to 1 or closer to 1 to 1 of carbs to protein. Uh, and the carbs that I'm taking aren't things like you know, cakes or breads or pastas or anything like that. It's, it's stuff that's uh, you know, slower to break down like vegetables, uh, lots of vegetables, some fruit. Uh, and then some whole grain stuff every once in a while, like you know, maybe brown rice, uh, but not too much of it. And uh, like sweet potatoes, sweet potatoes work very well with uh, metabolic efficiency training. Um, but most of my diet changes were sort of increasing and you know just sort of focusing on take, making sure I take in uh, that ratio of carbs to protein. And so I increased my protein intake, and I have lots of lean proteins like chicken and um, uh, you know, chicken and uh, I've lots of healthy fats as well, like avocado. Um, another other changes, like for breakfast, instead of having things like peanut butter and jelly, that was my go-to. <laughs> I used to have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Some, sometimes like three three of them before uh, a long ride on the weekend. Um, but that's a lot of carbs. It's two slices of bread, and then there's jelly on there, which is just pure sugar, and then there's the peanut butter, and the peanut butter is is good. Um, but that's really the only redeeming factor of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich from a metabolic efficiency standpoint. <laughs> so it's more like a four to one ratio uh, for a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So instead, I changed that, and now I just have something like one slice of bread with a nice thick layer of peanut butter on it and some seeds, like chia seeds or something, uh, to add a little crunch to it or crunchy peanut butter, uh, and don't put the jelly on it, and no second slice of bread. So now it's with, now it's about one and a half to one. Um, so that's one thing that I, I changed. So I could still have my uh, my peanut butter fix, <laughs> and then uh, another thing I would have maybe uh, you know I'd have, I have a lot of Greek yogurt, um, add some seeds to it or some fruit. Um, I have omelets and you know, maybe bacon and things <laughs> that people think aren't healthy, but they work just fine in the metabolic efficiency diet. So it's not like you're changing. It. Like I really didn't find the transition to be that difficult. I found it to be. Uh, I still eat tons and tons of foods that I love. So it, it really. I don't miss uh, many foods. And Matt, this is great. You know, I think for people, it's always helpful to hear like uh, you know some some real world application in terms of what you're actually eating. And and you alluded to this, but really, uh, with metabolic efficiency, it's about focusing on protein, fiber, and fat with every. Uh, with every meal, you know, and if you kind of start there and then instead of treating the carbohydrate as your main um, portion of that meal, that's that's a great way to get people to think about it. And and also, you know, like you talked about, it's it's trying as much as possible not to eat carbohydrates on their own. So when you add protein to a carbohydrate, you know, you're minimizing this spike and crash effect uh, on blood sugar. You know, the protein is slowing uh, the absorption of the, of the carbohydrate and it's, and it's releasing more steadily. So that's kind of the, uh, the science behind it. So, uh, with all this, you know, there's a daily nutrition element to it, but then Harvey, uh, you know, you, you spoke about this, uh, you know, there's also, uh, uh, training nutrition, a sports nutrition element to it. Like how do I, how do I fuel my workouts? Um, you know, if I'm trying to get away from the sugar based fuels and, and to be metabolically efficient, and this is really where you can comes in. So, you know, as we talked about um, a few moments ago, you know, most of your sports nutrition products out there, uh, they're sugar-based and, and they essentially work the same. You know, it's just about what flavor you like, uh, what settles better in your stomach. But from an energy delivery standpoint, they're all designed to give you energy quickly. You know, you had your early um, products like your Gatorades and your Powerades of the world, which, you know, use simple sugars, fructose, glucose, and sucrose. Your newer products, uh, there's there's a, only a few, um, you know, up here, but really this applies for Goo, Accelerate, uh, Hammer, uh, Cliff. They all use maltodextrin, which is, you know, the more complex carbohydrate. It was certainly an improvement over simple sugars in that it was easier on the stomach for athletes. It was slightly more complex, got out of the stomach quicker, but it still is going to cause that yo-yo effect, that spike and crash in your blood sugar. So what's really unique uh, and sets you can apart from anything else out there is, is really the backstory to how it was created and what it was developed for. So 
Uh, UCAN was originally developed for Jonah, uh, who's the son of our founder, um, who you see on the screen. And, and Jonah has a very rare blood sugar disease. So when we all consume a carbohydrate, uh, basically the process by which it gives us energy is the carbohydrates broken down into our liver, it's converted into glucose, and then it's released into our bloodstream. And that's the process by which you know a carbohydrate is converted um, to, to give us blood sugar and to give us energy. Jonah had a kid, a genetic defect that essentially prevented him from breaking down carbohydrates and converting them into glucose. So it was kind of a catch-22. If he didn't consume carbs, he would get severely hypoglycemic or, or low blood sugar, low energy, and uh, you know this could result in life-threatening seizures. But if he did consume carbs because his liver couldn't break them down and convert them into glucose, this would cause other health complications. They'd all get backed up in his liver and, and you know, could result in something called fatty liver disease where it's basically a bunch of carbohydrates getting backed up in his liver. Um, so Jonah's family, they were really proactive you know, because what, what their life really was from the time Jonah was born in 2000 was setting multiple alarm clocks, waking up every two hours uh, to feed Jonah small doses of cornstarch. Now, they found that cornstarch uh, was able to be broken down and, and converted into glucose by these kids. Uh, it, it had a little bit slower of a breakdown than other carbohydrates, but they were only able to consume enough of the cornstarch at a time uh, to give them about an hour, 45 to two hours of, of that steady blood sugar, steady energy. So, um, you know, 10 to 12 times a day, Jonah's parents would have to feed him, you know, uh, a set finite dose of cornstarch. This included three to four feedings in the middle of the night where they had to set multiple alarm clocks and wake up in the middle of the night to feed their child. So Jonah's family, they were really proactive. They were looking for a better way. In 2000, um, they basically um, started working with some of the top carbohydrate researchers in the world, and, and they were looking for what they call the world's best carbohydrate. Now, in their context, the world's best carb was something that broke down slowly and steadily over time so they could give it to Jonah instead of entering a system very quickly, like, you know, your simple carbs, it would break down slowly and, and maintain that steady blood sugar over a long period of time. Um, you know, the goal was at least to have them be able to sleep through the night. For eight years, the top carbohydrate researchers, they looked at all types of carbohydrates. They looked at rices, barley, wheat, tapioca, different types of starches, different types of grains. And eventually, you know, they looked at everything that was out there, maltodextrin, you know, everything that uh, waxy maize starches. And eventually what they found was that Starting with non-GMO cornstarch, uh, they put it through a very specific cooking process. Uh, it's completely natural, just heat and water over a period of 40 hours. And, and essentially what this cooking process did was cause the carbohydrate to break down slowly over time and essentially act almost in a time-release manner. So they were able to give uh, Jonah a large dose of this new carbohydrate, which, which is called super starch. They were able to give him roughly 90 grams of it prior to sleeping at night. And before it, because it broke down slowly and steadily, that was able to stabilize his energy and stabilize his blood sugar throughout the entire night. Um, so that's really what super starch is. And, and it's really that cooking process, which now uh, UCAN has the patent on, that makes it totally different than just your regular cornstarch. So, you know, if you could go buy corn, you know, Jonah was taking, if you remember, regular cornstarch every two hours. So... Um, the fact that he could take this all at once and, and it would, uh, you know, give him that slow and steady release of glucose is, is kind of showing how it's different and works differently than regular cornstarch. Um, a couple notes on this, you know, carbohydrate, like I talked about, it's completely natural. The corn is non-GMO. Um, it's also gluten-free and it's a food. So the great thing about super starch, it's less processed than oatmeal. You know, the, originally the first people that were, were actually using it were young infants, young children. So it, it's a food product. You know, it's not a supplement. Um, it's a food. And it's really that non-GMO cornstarch cooked with heat and water. Um, so, you know, around 2008, some of the people that were involved with this initial research for glycogen storage disease, they started wondering what would happen if, you know, regular folks took this or athletes took this. So before launching into sports nutrition, you know, we wanted to test our carb against maltodextrin, which is what, um, you know, really uh, the majority of the sports nutrition products are using. Um, and one of the guys we consulted was Bob Sebahar, whose name we've brought up a few times, uh, who was the Olympic dietitian for the triathlon team. And uh, we told Bob, you know, this is what we've got. This is the way it works. Um, you know, does this have any benefit? And, and what Bob really told us um, kind of is what pushed us into sports. Bob said, you know, there's nothing out there like this right now. The main thing I'm trying to do with all my athletes is stabilize their blood sugar. But from a sports nutrition standpoint, Really, what I have to do is feed them some type of sugar-based fuel. It doesn't really matter what the brand is. It all kind of works the same. I have to feed them every you know, 20 to 30 minutes. 
to maintain their blood sugar. If, if I had something that I could give them that would stabilize their blood sugar on their own, then you know we wouldn't have to feed them so often. We wouldn't risk the same GI distress. So Bob told us that simultaneously, we wanted to see if our carb was any different than maltodextrin. And, and what you're seeing on the graph really tells the story. So with maltodextrin, you know, we looked at a 25 gram dose, which is roughly what you find in a typical gel product. And if you look at the blue line, you see that big spike. And then between by about 30 minutes on the x-axis, that significant blood sugar drop. And, you know, that kind of makes sense, right? Why do they tell you to take a gel every 30 to 40 minutes? It's because it coincides with that time your blood sugar drops. Meanwhile, with UCAN, what you see is the same 25 grams, 100 calories of our carbohydrate. It doesn't give you that big initial spike, but the significant thing is the, the, the drop is actually slow and steady, you know, so there's no huge sugar crash. And if you look at about 90 minutes to two hours later on the x-axis, your blood sugar with the UCAN with the red line is right around baseline. So it's still right around where it started, which really means because there's no big drop, and because that blood sugar is, is staying steady for about 90 minutes to two hours, uh, the same amount of calories from UCAN are actually going to last you two to three times as long as, you know, the 100 calories from the maltodextrin. Another thing, and then Matt, I'll get, uh, get back to you. And another really important thing to look at is what you see on this graph is, uh, is the insulin response. So we talked about insulin and its impact on, on fat burning, right? With uh, your typical fast acting carbs, you spike your blood sugar. You spike your insulin, your body's going to say, you know, store fat rather than burn it. With UCAN, we have a carbohydrate that because of that slow release, uh, it doesn't elicit an insulin response. So because there's no sugar spikes from UCAN, the body doesn't perceive a need to release this hormone insulin. We're basically, by doing that, we're giving you a steady source of carbohydrate without blocking your ability to tap into and utilize fat for fuel. So when Matt talks about doing, you know, uh, an Ironman on 94 calories per hour, that's just what he's intaking, but because of that blood sugar stabilization, he's getting you know calories from his stored body fat as well, and and that's that's really what's so cool about you can you know you're getting that steady release of carbohydrate, which is uh, you know important to help maintain your energy. It's important for the brain, but you're also getting the dual fuel by burning and utilizing your stored fat at the same time. Um, so Matt, let's let's actually talk through specifically what you did um, at Ironman Maryland. We we see your splits uh, up on the screen, and um, uh, I actually, you know, I sorry I had that time wrong. It's actually eight fifty one twenty four. It's uh, I, I think, or or was it eight fifty one nineteen? Am I wrong on that? Uh, no, it's eight fifty one nineteen. Uh, the, oh, okay, that's okay. the official time. The twenty four is what was on the board uh, behind me when you looked uh, in that picture. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. So we got we got this all we got this right. The official time right. So let's. Let's talk through uh, what you did for Ironman Maryland and show folks that uh, this really is possible. So uh, take us through, uh, we see it on the uh, uh, screen, but take us through what you did uh, prior to the race. Yeah, people are sort of amazed by how simple it is. So it's, it doesn't take long to explain what I, what I took in for Ironman Maryland. So my breakfast was uh, you know, what I described to people as a metabolically efficient breakfast. I had at 4.45 when I woke up, I had two slices of my favorite. It's the uh, Martin's whole wheat potato bread. Um, with three tablespoons of peanut butter on each one. So like I said, a nice thick layer of it. Uh, so I had that at 4.45. Um, it's a ratio of something like one and a half to, to one. Uh, so it didn't spike my blood sugar. Um, allowed my body to continue to burn fat. And then at 6.10, uh, the race went off at 7 a.m., uh, as many Ironman events do. Uh, at 6.10 a.m., uh, I had one shot of UCAN, which is approximately four to six ounces of water with one scoop of you can, so it was about 80 calories uh, worth of fuel. Uh, and then during the race, um, on the bike, I had one bottle of, actually it's right there on that, on that slide, but I had one bottle of three scoops of, of lemonade you can with one salt capsule uh, at around mile 30. So I took it in between mile 25 and 35-ish. Um, and then I separated it from a goo roctane. So the reason why there's goo on here is because it was still early on in my experience with metabolic efficiency training and with, with using UCAN. And so I actually didn't trust it enough. And Nikki said, like, it's okay. Like, let's, we're going to work with it and we're going to allow you to use one of your crutches, like this, this goo that I used to use in all of my racing. And I was just so worried that, you know, just taking a leap of faith and just using my fat stores and using UCAN, I, I was worried. So I, uh, I kept the goo in there. But one thing that she advised me on was that I should make sure I take it uh, se separate it by some time because if you take the UCAN, it'll keep your blood sugar stable, 
then when you take the goo, it's going to spike your blood sugar and it's going to stop me from burning fat and the UCAN is not going to be as effective. So I separated it by some time. So I had uh, one bottle at around mile 30 and then I had one goo at mile 60 and then one more bottle just like the other one at mile 80 uh, and then a goo at mile 100. So it was uh, 680 calories on the bike and I, I actually had to stuff down the second bottle of UCAN because I felt full. I felt like you can, it's just so satisfying and so sustaining that, you know, it, it's different, it's different than any other drink. Like it's, it actually, it's actually thicker and you, you just feel it being more sustaining and you don't feel hungry. Uh, you just sort of have the steady energy. Uh, and then on the run, uh, I just had one and a half goose. So I had one at mile 13 and I had one at, actually had a half of one at uh, mile 21. I, I planned on having, uh, some Red Bull actually, another one of my crutches during, um, special needs, but it turned out I couldn't get it, so instead I had a half a goo. So 150 calories on the run. So total, I had 830 calories, or 94 calories per hour. Never felt like bonking, and then, I, you know, obviously I have a note down there, I had water throughout the race as, as I felt I needed it. So a, a lot of great points there, Matt, and so two things I want to hone in on. Um, number one, that last point you raised, you know, water throughout the race is needed. I think um, with UCAN, and, and, you know, we even saw this with the UCAN shot you took for breakfast, uh, there's really no amount. It's it's one of the, the key aspects of it is uh, because of how complex the carbohydrate is. Um, I get a little bit sciencey on you guys for one more second, but um, when people talk about a complex carbohydrate, they they are ref they're referencing the molecular weight. So larger molecules get out of the stomach quickly. Your small molecules, like your simple sugars, sit in the gut. They draw water into your your GI tract, and and that's a lot of times what causes that GI distress from the gels or the, the simple sugars. So. Um, with the super starch, one of the big things is how easy it is on the stomach. And, it, you know, the fact that you can mix it as thin or as thick as you'd like, and it doesn't affect digestion. It doesn't impact, you know, it impacts the taste and texture, but it doesn't impact the way it settles in your stomach. Um, so to that effect, Matt, um, I, you know, I think it's important that people consider you can, even though it's a drink, don't view it as a, a hydration substitute. It's, it's, it's important to kind of keep your hydration separate and to keep your UCAN separate and, and think of UCAN as your fuel and, and you know, dose with UCAN as needed. Um, so that's one point. But going back to the bike, you know, uh, when, when you say, you know, mile 30, three scoops of, of UCAN, were you sipping on this over a, a certain period of time? Or were you trying to get those 240 calories of UCAN in your system pretty quickly? How, how did you kind of think about that? And yeah, Nikki told me that I, with you can it's it's sort of different. You can take a bunch of it at the at, at one time. I could have downed the whole bottle within two miles and um, and been fine. You know, it just uh, you know your body absorbs it um, quickly and it doesn't bother your stomach. Like if you just downed a whole bottle of uh, you know EFS or something, then your pro your stomach would probably be in turmoil from all the sugar. Um, but with you can, it, it doesn't. It's so easy on the stomach. I, I could have taken the whole bottle um, in, you know, like I said, within a couple miles. I think I took it in um, over the course of about maybe five or ten miles. So I, I would, you know, pick up the bottle, I'd suck down a third of it, and then I'd put it back. And then a couple miles later, I'd pull it out again and, you know, suck down another third of it. And then, you know, so it took maybe five to ten miles um, for me to for me to take it down. Um, but Nikki told me you can do it however you'd like. Uh, you can take it as fast or as slow as you want. And that's, that's, that's right on, Matt. And I think that's, you know, even what you're, you're saying, you know, with UCAN, again, because it's not a hydration drink, even though it's a drink, um, at, at least, uh, you know, we do have a hydration product that's separate, but the, the UCAN super starch drink mixes, they're not hydration. So um, you do want to try to get a substantial amount in you at once, just as, uh, as Matt's talking about, and, and really view it, you know, as uh, you view consuming a food. Um, Harvey, let's get to you for a moment. So, um, you know, you, you look at what Matt did for Ironman Maryland. I mean, how much can you relate to, to his fuel plan? You've done some pretty impressive uh, triathlon efforts on, um, you know, a, a, a low number of calories uh, to what people are used to. How does that compare to what you've done? Well, obviously, I mean, I got to give Matt major props. I mean, he, I think he's won. Uh, the only, I don't know, I mean, you, you guys probably know this better than I do, but there isn't too many age groupers that win an entire Ironman. Are there? Matt? Um, yeah, Matt, you, you know better than me. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, amateur that has this. <laughs> so well done there, and I mean, his plan is pretty similar to what we use. It's, you know, it's pretty functional. It, it works with 
different size people. We don't throw those goos in there. Um, but, uh, you know, he's, that was something that, that worked for him. Um, the, some of the things that he's mentioned, there are some of the snacks that you can use in conjunction with it, like bacon. Believe it or not, we have athletes that bring bacon on Ironman, and they use that as a snack when they want to choose something other than drinking down the, uh, the you can. I mean, I have other people that, eat, you know, do little wraps of, uh, you know, the, I'll, I want to call it low-carb wraps with some of the almond butters in them and things. And they come up with little snacks that augment the, uh, the you can because sometimes they just want something to chew on and that sort of thing. But his, his plan is not that much different from, from the rest of the population um, that use the product. So um, you know, maybe we, we're not as effective racing as he is with it, but, you know, we're all getting – some pretty good results and um you know we're not we're not having the same kind of stomach issues that a lot of people blame for their bad days and i think uh, harvey you you raised one point where people are always asking us you know what what goes well with you can and, and matt you mentioned this where we're with you know like nikki told you um if you're going to consume like a, a fast acting sugar uh it's it's kind of best to space it out instead of you know having you can and then doing your gel protocol um you know kind of every every 20 or 30 minutes so spacing it out like you did will kind of uh uh be a, a better approach uh, but harvey what you're talking about you know things that work well in conjunction with you can i always tell people you know think about you can you can is your carbohydrate it's your energy source so if you need to eat for hunger like you don't need to eat a gel to curb hunger you know that's not going to curb your hunger so um getting people to focus on you know sources of protein or sources of fat um that that uh they can snack on and and easily digest um during their ride those are things that from a hunger standpoint if you get hungry while you're on the bike uh with you can you know Matt you mentioned that you know it really takes care of your hunger but for other folks you know having something like you know almond butter packets or you know if if you can tolerate it snacking on nuts um you know, having a low sugar bar and cutting that up and snacking on that in between your doses of UCAN, those are things that will actually curb that physical stomach hunger um, that people might experience if they're out there for, for a really long time. But for anyone that isn't familiar with UCAN, just to quickly walk you through our products, there's essentially four different versions of UCAN. And, and the lemonade UCAN that Matt was talking about that, that he used primarily for Ironman Maryland, that's the UCAN fuel that you see. So that's the super starch plus some electrolytes. That's uh, really the, the most critical time to have that is 30 minutes prior to, to your training or, or your race uh, as a pre-exercise snack. Um, and then, you know, generally we're seeing people supplement with uh, an additional uh, scoop to scoop and a half of it. Or, or if you have the single serve packets, a packet uh, every 75 to 90 minutes. So they're spacing out the dosing, you know, with about uh, 80 to 120 calorie serving of UCAN every 75 to 90 minutes. That comes in four fruit flavors, an orange, pomegranate, lemonade, and um, cranberry, raspberry. And then there's the UCAN with protein. So this also has the super starch in it, same amount of super starch per serving as the, the UCAN fuel. Um, and then it has uh, the electrolytes and it has added whey protein. So this is a fantastic uh, way to recover without the sugar. Um, you know, when you keep your blood sugar steady with the super starch after exercise, instead of having something like chocolate milk or, you know, a, a big bowl of pasta, you're allowing your body to continue burning fat in that post-workout period, um, which is a great time to burn fat. So the you can with protein works great for recovery, but it's also a, a fuel that, you know, Harvey, I know you've used it pre-race. Uh, a lot of people will use the you can with protein either pre-race or during race as well, because the protein in the product will help curb some of that stomach hunger and then you're getting the slow burn uh from the carbohydrate to keep your energy and blood sugar steady then we have yeah, the barn uh, yep go for it harvey can yep. i jump right in with the you can fuel a lot of people not a lot of people but in the past you know that orange that orange flavor is beautiful and it doesn't clump but in the past people have dealt with some clumping issues um if it just sits and it doesn't get shaken enough what some of my athletes have done is taken some uh, you know the smoothie shakers, they have a metal agitator in there. They stuff that into their torpedo bottle or if they're going to keep it on their down tube. But, uh, so sometimes if they sh that, put that agitator, if they put it into their drink bottle on their bike, uh, that might eliminate any time. Sometimes you'll get some clumping issues. The orange doesn't seem to ever have that really. And, and uh, 
so that's one little little hack that we've come up with. Another hack is um, the lemonade matched with fruit punch, uh, Powerade Zero, seems to also reduce clumping. But now that we have the orange one, it doesn't seem to be an issue. But just in case that ever was to come up for someone, they can in, you know inject the uh, the agitator into the water bottle, and that kind of breaks it up. That's a, uh, it's a good suggestion, Harvey. So yeah, certainly, um, you know, with anything that you combine with, you can, again, if you're tr- trying to keep the sugar low, so Harvey mentioned power eight zero, but if you're doing something with a little bit of sugar, you know, try to keep it uh, one or two ounces of that to keep the sugar low and just utilize it more for flavor. Um, we also have the, you can snack bars with the super starch. Um, you know, they have the super starch protein, fiber, and fat to help curb hunger. The super starch is going to give you that steady energy. So those have worked great as like a morning breakfast bar, you know, don't have as much sugar as something like a power bar or a cliff bar. So they're really supporting the same, you know, metabolic efficiency and steady blood sugar principles of you can, uh, you will see us very soon right now. The bar comes in just one flavor. It has a chocolate coating on it. So it might not be ideal to carry on the bike in, in warm weather because of the melting. But, um, you know, you will see us come out with an uncoated bar that won't melt, uh, in the upcoming months. And then, and then finally we've got the, uh, you can hydrate, which is just our, uh, electrolyte replacement. This doesn't have the super starch in it. It's just an electrolyte uh, replacement uh, with no sugar, no calories, completely natural, sweetened with stevia, and it has double the magnesium, which is a, an electrolyte that a lot of people are deficient in. Um, and, uh, you know, it has double the magnesium as most um, electrolyte products. Um, so, Matt, uh, I want to take it back to you for a moment. Um, you know, uh, as we look kind of uh, at, you know, one of the things I do want to say is how important it is to implement UCAN into your training. Uh, UCAN is really should be viewed as, as a training tool, something that's going to allow you to optimize, you know, the benefits of exercise uh, as much as possible and, and really supporting that fat burning that exercise is already uh, accomplishing. How do you utilize UCAN, Matt, in your uh, day-to-day training? Yeah, I'll give a couple examples. One would be, say I have a two-hour workout. Um, either let's say it's a two-hour, or let's say it's an hour-and-a-half ride, or maybe like an hour-and-a-half to two-hour long run. Uh, I'll have a dose of UCAN, which might be a scoop, scoop and a half of UCAN in about you know, maybe six ounces of water or eight ounces of water. Uh, and I'll have that about half an hour to 45 minutes before my workout. So I do a lot of my training at Tailwind Endurance in the city. Uh, it's my coach's uh, compu trainer studio. Uh, on my train into the city, I'll drink my UCAN uh, about a half hour before I get in, uh, and then I'm ready. I do my workout, and I just have water during the workout, um, so that it sustains me through the, the one and a half to two hours. Uh, that works great. And then you know, the second example I can give is a longer ride or a longer workout. So maybe uh, on the weekend, I might do a brick. Uh, let's say it's like a you know 56 mile ride, and then I'm running six miles off the bike. Um, I'll have a metabolically efficient breakfast uh, about maybe a half hour uh, before I start my workout, uh, which might be like like you saw before, a slice of bread with some peanut butter, uh, maybe some seeds. And then when I get on the bike, I'll have one one bottle. Let's say it's like a 56 mile bike, so maybe you know three hours or so. Um, I would have one bottle if you can with three scoops. Um, so one full bottle of water with three scoops of you can. And I would take that on the bike, and then I wouldn't have anything on the run. And then I'd have some water depending on how hot it was. Or if it was extra hot, I would take, uh, put a salt capsule in with, uh, with the bottle of UCAN. Uh, and that's it. So with the one bottle of UCAN with three scoops is, is, should sustain me for about four and a half hours, which is plenty for the workout. And it's 240 calories plus my breakfast. Um, and then when I get back, it's, I mean, it's insane, but I'm not feeling like I need to open up the fridge and eat everything that's in it, <laughs> which is how I felt when I would come back from rides, uh, drinking all the other sports mixed stuff. Uh, I'd come back from some, you know, four hour ride and I just eat everything in sight because I was so hungry. But now it, it just, you don't have that hunger. Uh, I, I can, if I wanted to, I could go hours after a workout without eating. I, I choose not to because I know that that's not, uh, the way that your body recovers. I, I immediately take in some, some food, some protein. Um, but, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. And, you know, we hear, we hear different things like, you know, hangry or, or, you know, that, that ravenous hunger that people get after they train. And, and it really is so tied into these fluctuations in blood sugar, right? So it, so it makes a lot of sense that you don't have that same uncontrolled hunger when you, you're keeping your blood sugar steady and, and even coming off a workout, you know, your blood sugar is still steady. So, uh, 
yeah, it's it's it makes uh, makes a ton of sense. Um, we have a couple questions. Uh, Matt and Harvey, I'll, I'll pose this one to both of you guys. Um, Matt, I'll start with you. Uh, you mentioned not getting hungry um, when you were having the lemonade you can during Ironman Maryland, but um, we had a question uh, from someone in the audience. Have you ever considered using the you can with protein, uh, you know, pre workout or or on the bike? Is that ever something you've experimented with or considered doing? I haven't experimented with it to this point. Uh, I have considered it, um, but the fact that I generally don't get hungry um, by using the re the regular you can uh, hasn't really driven me to experiment with uh, with the protein enhanced stuff. I do know a lot of a lot of people who do use it though. Uh, I know protein in general is sort of harder for your body to digest, um, so that, like I guess it's important to note that you can is carbohydrates. It is pure car carbohydrate. So some people get confused with that because they're like, oh, well, your whole diet, metabolic efficiency training, is about you know stabilizing blood sugar and not taking in straight carbs. But you can is straight a carb, so they don't understand. But the thing is, that the reason why you can is so different and what makes it so unique is that it's a carb that doesn't spike your blood sugar. And it's really the only sports mix drink that I'm aware of that does that. Um, but I do know plenty of people who do use the uh, protein enhanced you can um, because maybe they feel it uh, it satisfies them more. Um, you know, makes them not have any uh, any hunger. Uh, yeah, Matt. That to to that point about the carb, that's a great point. And to to reiterate, you know, it's really um, like some people. Uh, the way I tell them to think of this is, it's similar in theory to you know, why somebody would eat a sweet potato before they work out, right? It's, it's still a carbohydrate, but it's, it's, it's a lower glycemic carbohydrate and it's, and it's not spiking their blood sugar to the same extent. So with you can, the, the, you know, there's, there's many carbs that may not spike your blood sugar, but with you can, the uniqueness of it, I would say is twofold. Number one, it's how easy it is on the stomach. Um, I don't know a lot of people that could tolerate, you know, uh, having a sweet potato every 75 to 90 minutes on the bike. If, if you can more power to you, um, but also it's it's the the how long it maintains blood sugar. So remember with Jonah and kids with this disease, you know, they were looking at every carbohydrate out there. And while there was other things that didn't cause that spike, there was nothing that maintained that steady level of blood sugar for as long as the super starch. And that's what's so significant about it when we're talking about, you know, training and, and exercise is, is its ability to maintain that steady blood sugar and steady energy uh, longer than any other food or any other sports nutrition um, out there. Uh, Harvey, how about with you? Uh, you've uh, implemented the UCAN with protein um, both prior to and during races. Uh, what was your reasoning behind that, and how's it worked for you? Um, um, so I have used it before. <clears throat> I don't know that I've ever used it during uh, during races. I kind of tend to lean towards the plain or the orange. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, I have used it before and after with the protein, but not during so much. But I have had I have had athletes that weren't uh, full enough, so they added the protein to their training and to their racing. So that would really be the reasoning behind, you know, adding the you can with protein. Is uh, I always tell people from an energy standpoint, it's going to work pretty much the same. It's if you get hungry, uh, you know, during training or if you're entering a workout. Um, you know, and you haven't eaten in five or six hours and you want a little bit of protein to help curb the stomach. Uh, you know, Matt did talk about the fact that for some athletes, protein will bother the stomach during training. So you certainly want to play around with it. But, uh, you know, a scoop of the protein you can is only about seven or eight grams of protein per serving. A packet is, uh, you know, maybe about 13 grams of protein per serving. So it's not, you know, it's not a ton of protein. So if, if you're a little bit hungry, um, that's a great option to, to add uh, before or during your training. Um, Matt, the, one of the, uh, other questions for both of you guys is the timing of, you know, how long did it take you when you were playing around with UCAN to figure out, um, okay, you know, I've had it before and this is like how much into my exercise I have to have an additional serving of it. This is how much I have to have of it. How, how did you go about figuring out that whole process? And, uh, Matt, we'll start with you. Yeah, I had some guidance from Nikki, so I think I found that point faster than I, others might using trial and error on their own, but, uh, the guidance from UCAN that's up here on the screen actually is uh, is a pretty good starting point. Um, so you know, sort of start with that, and then if you feel like you're you're needing more, then take it uh, maybe 15 minutes uh, more frequently. So you know, instead of every 75 to 90, maybe you have it more on the 75 to even 60 minute side, uh, because everybody's different. Uh, you know, some people I know for me, especially because 
um, you know, I'm, I'm practicing metabolic efficiency training. My body is very fat adapted. It's very good at burning fat at these paces. And so you can is even more effective for me than it would be for somebody who is not as fat adapted. Uh, so I tell people all the time, you know, you can, it's great by itself. Metabolic efficiency training is powerful by itself. You combine the two and it's even better. It's just amazing. Like it's mind blowing the types of things that you can do with, uh, with, with these, like the, how few calories you can take in on these workouts and feel the way that you do. And that's, yeah, and I think that, oh, sorry. No, sorry. Go, go ahead, Harvey. Go ahead and then I'll yeah, chime in. Yeah, I was in. just going to say, yeah, that was one of the things that really bothered me about my, tra my fueling. Um, prior to learning about the product and metabolic efficiency was uh, that I thought you had to fuel with sugar and any at every single workout you had to be always loading uh, loading the sugar as soon as you started you know it was like 15 minutes before take a gel start taking them every 20 25 minutes and that sort of thing and uh, you know it, Bob talked about, you know, your body having two to three hours of glycogen stores for every, uh, you know, for two to three hours of uh, moderate exercise. So it was just, uh, to me, let's see, when do I start feeling hungry and kind of listen to my body. And I found out that I could train, you know, a lot of my workouts, uh, which would be shorter ones during the week. I wouldn't need any products hour and a half that sort of thing and I could pretty much go two three hours uh, with just water or a small dose of you can beforehand so um, I think you know one of the dangers is people are they're not recognizing that their body does have glycogen stores that it can operate off of and that the you can would be useful but it's not necessary for, for anything less than you know two hours unless they're going really hard and then you're probably wanting to, to make sure that you have some some coverage and, and it all depends to that point you know it, it really depends on the goals so I think um, one of the great things with you can is you, depending on how long you're going you could simply tweak the amount of you can you take so if you're going for 45 minutes or an hour uh, and you, you know you uh, a lot of people will just take half a packet or half a scoop you know 40 calories of you can because the thing is for a lot of folks, you don't necessarily need extra fuel uh, before some of those shorter workouts, but you always want to keep your blood sugar steady. And especially if you have a weight loss goal, you know, what, with what Harvey said, you could certainly might be able to work out for an hour or for 90 minutes, uh, you know, fasted. But then the, the consequence is what's your blood sugar going to be like after that workout? And are you going to overcompensate, uh, you know, by eating a lot because you're ravenous because of low blood sugar? So a lot of people like to use UCAN before some of those shorter, before some of those high intensity workouts, almost as insurance to say that, hey, when I'm done exercising, you know, my blood sugar is going to be steady and, uh, you know, it's going to impact my post-workout hunger. Or if I have something else to do after I train and I can't get a meal in me right away, having that you can before is going to give me that insurance where my blood sugar isn't um, so low. So I want to um, just uh, raise a few more questions that people have on here. Uh, Matt and Harvey, I know we're a little bit over, but if you guys don't mind sticking around for another five or 10 minutes, uh, we have a lot of great questions from folks in the crowd. So I uh, just want to uh, address a few more of those. Um, we said, uh, had a question from, um, let's see, from uh, Rick um, asking, do I need to significantly cut back on sugar outside of training to benefit from UCAN during training and racing? So um, you know, I'll give my answer and then uh, kick it to both of you guys. Um, I think one of the analogies I always like to use is if somebody's trying to lose weight, um, for example, and they're trying to cut soda out of their diet, they're not going to say if I, you know, it, it, it's not logical to think that, hey, I either need to have, if you're having two sodas a day or, you know, 10 sodas a week, you're not going to say I either need to have zero or I'm going to have all 10. You know, there's there's a, there's something in the middle, you know, so with, even with you can and metabolic efficiency, like Matt talked about, both of them work great on their own. When you combine them together, um, you can start to get the types of results that Matt's seeing and that Harvey are seeing. But for a lot of people, if they're not ready to make jump into the full dietary changes or, or they want to do it, you know, kind of bit by bit, uh, you can is really a tool to stabilize blood sugar and you want to stabilize blood sugar as much as possible throughout your day. So, you're doing it one time a day, which is around the time you work out. You know what? That's still better than than not doing it. Um, and that's the way to think about it. You know, a lot of people 
if they don't want to buy into the full diet, they say, you know what, I'm going to go with you can. I might cut my calories back from 400 to 150 or 200. And for the time being, that's good enough for me. But it's combining the two can have really, really powerful effects. Uh, Matt, I guess for you, you started using them, <clears throat> doing them both in conjunction with each other. So you might not have any experience with uh, doing one or the other on its own, uh, or, or maybe you do. Uh, can you speak to that overall point? Yeah, uh, I started working with Nikki, and then within about a couple of weeks, she had already um, suggested me, me that I use uh, UCAN. Uh, so like you, like you said, I sort of started using them at around the same time. So I didn't really have too much experience uh, having using just UCAN or uh, just uh, metabolic efficiency training, but uh, sort of did them together. Uh, you know, learning and experimenting with both um, at the same time. Harvey, what about you? Have you had athletes? Uh, I, I know for yourself, the story might be similar to Matt uh, in terms of doing both at the same time. Have you have, had athletes that have succeeded uh, using UCAN without, um, you know, making the full-on dietary changes? Uh, you know, to me, I almost want to change the, answer, the way that question's asked. I find that the biggest issue, uh, apart from the fueling, is you know, training and fitness and people just thinking that they're fit and they're overshooting their swim, their early bike, their later bike. So what I find is it's a bigger, there's a bigger question of why they're having problems. And uh, it, it's not just about what they're eating. It's also about how they're training. And it's important that they, they get the fitness necessary for the distance that they're racing, that they learn pacing because, you know, that's so crucial. So I didn't mean to change the, the question, but everything that leads to a better performance, um, this, is a, this is a big part of it, what we're talking about, but a lot of people are underfit and overpacing. And these are, these are areas that you can't overcome with just a product, you know, with a real revolutionary product. You, you still can't overcome those aspects. And, um, and that, that to me is the bigger issue, but I don't mean to change it, but that's kind of how I, I think many people are under, under trained and overpacing and, the, the, and they're blaming the food, um, the fuel sources rather than looking at their training. And that's, that's a good point to speak to that. You know, I always tell people, think of UCAN as a tool to stabilize your blood sugar. So, you know, we're giving you a tool in your belt, but you still have to do the training, put in the work. So it's, it's like anything, you know, the more you buy into this fully, the better result you're going to see, but um, you know, nothing on its own is going to be uh, a miracle. Um, Matt, let's. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Uh, you know, um, you had mentioned uh, the last race you did. Uh, you were uh, pretty new to UCAN, pretty new to metabolic efficiency, and uh, you know, still used a few of the goos. Now you've got a race coming up, the Eagle Man, this weekend. Um, what is your fuel plan for this weekend? Yep, good question. Um, for a half Ironman, it's less than half as complex than it is for an Ironman. <laughs> so the way I think about it is an Ironman is probably about five times as difficult to fuel yourself uh, as a half Ironman because your your body has carbohydrate and fat stores enough to sustain you for two plus hours. And so if, you know, in a half Ironman, it's only going to be four something hours for me. So there's really only a two something hour bridge that I need to, to create for myself with, uh, with food. And so I'm going to have, um, a breakfast of one slice of bread with peanut butter. And then I'm going to have a shot of you can before the race. And then during the race, the only thing I'm going to have is one bottle of you can with three scoops on the bike. That's it. And water. And will you time that, um, you know, you can, uh, the, that you have on the bike, will you try to time a certain amount of it um, towards the end of the bike to carry you through the run? Or, or how do you, how do you mm -hmm. deal with the timing of that um, in order to make sure that yep. you intake something before the run? Yeah, that's exactly right. So before, you know, my breakfast and the shot of you can before I start the swim will be, uh, will sustain me long enough that uh, I'll be able to take that, that one and only bottle of you can during the bike, uh, during the, the latter half of the bike. Uh, so I'm probably going to have it somewhere around mile 30 or 40. Um, and uh, that'll sustain me throughout the run. Awesome. Um, well, Matt and Harvey, you guys have given us a ton of things to chew on, a th ton of things to talk about. Um, you know, I'll leave you guys both with one final question. Um, 
and Harvey, we'll start here with you. Um, what do you think the biggest impact? We've talked about the body composition standpoint, but you know, a lot of times you show up to races and and you um, it seems like people have a buffet uh, of fuels taped to their bike. Um, <laughs> can you just speak to the aspect, uh, both for your athletes and for yourself, um, in terms of simplifying the nutrition and the impact that it's had? Yeah, I mean, in, uh, well, first off, back to you know, like back to the main thing from what I believe to be what most triathletes are fighting with is the ballad bulge. Um, this, this approach, this metabolic efficiency, um, managing your carbohydrates and learning how to find fuels, you, you know, your sports nutrition that meets with your um, lifestyle and your goals to me is essential. It's going to keep you leaner. When you're leaner, you're going to be lighter and you're going to be faster. So, I mean, it's all a big, it's all a, uh, a huge algebraic equation. And some of the most important things are fitness, um, your weight, and your pacing. All this goes in conjunction with your fuels, and you kind of got to get it right. And if you don't get it right, you're going to suffer. And that is something that none of us like to see. So, you, you know, you want to listen to guys like Matt who've had success, and uh, and you also want to look and try these products out. I've been saying pretty loud, and and I get met with a lot of uh, t conflict about it. But I think that you should, for the general triathlete, by and large, the vast majority who's fighting the battle bolds, they should be trying this kind of approach as a first line of defense. They should not immediately go to the sugar ones, which we were conventionally brought to. You know, um, I think this is the way to start. If it doesn't work out for you after systematic trials and adjusting your dosages, then you can always fall back on the conventional miles. Again, not necessarily for the elite athletes, but definitely for the, the vast majority of uh, triathletes who are fighting the battle of the bulges. You know, start with this approach, back it down to a sugar one if you can't uh, find a successful point, and, uh, you know, recognize that your miles, your mileage may vary as far as dosing, when and how much, and uh, I think, you know, this, these will all be ingredients of successful days, and, you know, it didn't take me all that long to, to swap over to metabolic efficiency and you can within two months I dropped 30 pounds and you know 30 minutes from my PR so I definitely and we've seen so much success now this is not uh, this isn't unique um, so there that you know and Matt's not the only one that's won a big race with the product Harvey great insight from you uh, appreciate all your support enjoy the camps this weekend uh, we really appreciate your time and uh and uh, just, uh, yeah, continued success to you. I know you're coming off an injury, so uh, good health and uh, continued success to you. We really appreciate you being on tonight. Hey, thanks. And if they have any further questions, hit me up on TriCoach Georgia. Uh, we have the Facebook and the uh, uh, TriCoachGeorgia.com, and, you know, we'll, I'll be glad to answer any questions. And, and there's no charges. I just like to be helpful for people. So I uh, appreciate you having me on and definitely really felt honored to to hear Matt talk because he had a great day in Maryland. Matt, I wish well, you uh, good luck. In... Go, go ahead. Sorry, Harvey. Sorry, I also, also wish you good luck at Eagle Man. Go rock it, my man. <laughs> Thank you very much, Harvey. It's great to meet you. Yeah. Matt, we'll close it out You've with you. You've been an inspiration. Um, Harvey, great guy. And uh, Matt, we appreciate your time as well. Uh, I know uh, you're balancing a lot of things as you get ready for a big race this weekend. Uh, Final, uh, any final thoughts um, to leave us with? I, I'd like to find out the same thing I asked Harvey. You know, how much has it meant to you uh, in terms of simplifying the nutrition uh, and allowing you to focus on racing? And then if there's, uh, you know, any other final thoughts uh, you'd like to leave us with, I welcome that. Sure, yeah. I have the utmost confidence now in my nutrition. And I've never been able to say that until until using metabolic efficiency training, and you can, uh, leading into Ironman Maryland. And even, like I said, in Ironman Maryland, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure still but it sort of proved it to me. And then all my training so far this year and the, the few handful of races that I've done have just you know even further solidified it uh, in my mind that this is definitely the way that I'm going to go. And so actually touching on um, one of the questions that, uh, that somebody, that one, one person posed about um, how I used goo as my crutch 
and uh, during Ironman Maryland, and how will I do that in the future, or how will I how will I change my nutrition in the future? Um, in Kona uh, in October, so Ironman Maryland qualified me for Kona for this year, so I'll be that's my main race this year. Uh, with my my second biggest race being Eagle Man this weekend uh, in Kona, it's obviously a full Ironman, and so the the nutrition plan is going to be um, more complex than what I'm doing this weekend. Uh, but it's not going to be very complex at all. <laughs> I'm still just going to have uh, <laughs> I'm probably going to have the two bottles of You Can with three scoops on the bike, and then I'll probably have a concentrated flask of You Can during the run. Uh, so I'm prob I'm definitely not going to be using any of those crutches. I'm very very happy to say that I will never be having any of those sugar-based products ever again, like goo. Um, but uh, I'll be pretty much solely on you, Cam. Well, Matt, we just uh, I can't thank you enough. You've been a great ambassador uh, for you, Cam. Uh, really a great uh, ambassador for the triathlon community, and uh, you know answering a lot of questions. And I just want to put your info up uh, again on the screen. You know, Matt's Matt's an accessible guy and. Uh, Please do follow him on Twitter at Iron Matt Bach. Uh, I know he's great about uh, responding to questions when people ask him. So if you want to pick his brain about anything, uh, you know, nutrition related or not, um, I, I know Matt would appreciate that. And uh, and you know, Matt, again, thanks so much for the time. Uh, looking forward to uh, to keeping tabs on you this weekend, and uh, and hope you have a great uh, great great race at Eagle Man. And uh, you know, thank uh, thank Lauren for giving us uh, an hour and a half of your uh, time this evening. We really appreciate that. <laughs> I, I will let her know. Actually, she's listening in. I, heard, I just heard her whoop from downstairs. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, thank you. I, I love doing these events because I, I, I love being able to help people and share what I've learned because it's just so um, – revol it, it revolutionized the sport for me, the whole end of nutrition. So it's really uh, – I love helping people. So anybody that uh, is uh, watching or listening, um, follow me on Twitter, and I'm also on Facebook. You can feel free to friend me. And uh, you can message me on Facebook or um, yeah, uh, or send me a message on Twitter. So uh, happy to help anybody who has questions. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Matt and Harvey, uh, big thanks for giving up your time. We went close to an hour and 30. Uh, I have a feeling that with these topics, uh, there's never enough time in the day to, to talk about everything that we want to talk about. Um, so uh, just uh, two final logistical things before we sign off. Uh, stay tuned to your email in the next hour or two. You'll get a full recording of this entire session. We'll also send you a, a very special offer uh, if you'd like to try you can. So stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, this uh, will be available on our Facebook page. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see it floating around on social media. So it's so definitely something that you can access and and re-listen to. And, um, you know, if you, you do want to keep the conversation going, um, you, everyone will have my email when they get the recording. So you can feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, you can reach out to Matt and Harvey, but big thanks to everybody for chatting. You can and triathlon nutrition with us tonight. Thanks again, Matt. Thanks Harvey. Have a great night, Thank everybody. Bye-bye. Hey,